Up next on Deep Roots. We started out with a small group of eight. No confidence that you're ever gonna get a license. When I walked in, I saw a huge picture of a cannabis leaf and I'm like, where am I? Yes. We are in a giant dome right now. It's kind of a hybrid between the outdoor model and the indoor model. It is. In the cannabis space, it's a lot of trial and error in the beginning. Fortunately, Brandon came to us after he did that. You know? <laughs> and now he's just doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Autumn Carsey. I am the founder and CEO of Alchemy 29. Today we're here in beautiful San Diego at Zen Leaf. We're about to take a tour of their facility. Let's go. So Mike, tell me a little bit about how you got started in this industry and how you ended up here at Zen Leaf. Always been a supporter of this industry, and I've been in and around it uh, since about 2000. It's something I always believed in, and I appreciated it. A lot of my friends made a living in this industry for a very long time. You know, there's certain things that you see a lot of potential in. Generationally, it's something that doesn't come around very often. It was just something I wanted to be a part of. Um, it started because a friend of mine came back from Amsterdam with some seeds that she got from Sensei Seed Bank. I wasn't the best grower, you know, but but I got one here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I know where, where, where I need support, but uh, I've always been able to build things. And so we started out with a small group of eight of my best friends, right? And, and that was us, and we were gonna go into this. Everything happened pretty fast for us. Uh, but San Diego was going into what was called a lottery system. It basically means you have no confidence that you're ever gonna get a license. It was a lottery for your appointment time. And so there were chances that if all of those first 40 people had a good application, you were never gonna have a chance. Mm -hmm. So we luckily got one that was close to the, the top 40 and then we beat out a few people and got our stuff done in time. So you're probably like two to three years out yeah. from that point, right? I mean, Relatively it, speaking. I'm laughing now, but I was just, it was really painful. Uh, and then the business side of it is just fortunately and unfortunately something that I've been able to do. Because like sitting in this chair is like my least favorite place in this building. Uh, being yeah. in the rooms with the plants is, is definitely something I like to do. They're a very fast growing crop. So you get to see that plant kind of develop and you get to harvest it and it's basically the fruits of your labor. It's kind of like art, right? You're creating something that wasn't there before without yeah. your help, your idea and yeah. kind of infusing that. To without all the self-doubt. Create like. something, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, art's a funny one because you're always the whole time you're doing the painting, you're like, oh, this, is, this isn't working out. This is terrible. It's either like, like a really great experience, yeah. you know, but most of it's like, oh, this is not, you know. Sounds like the permitting and process. Then, <laughs> and then even once you get it done, like even when you're done with the painting, right, it's like even one that you're really happy with, like two weeks later, you're like, it's never done, done that right. different. Yeah, you know, I would have yeah. done, next time I would do that differently. Yeah. But no, this is, is it, it's great. So you get to take, you know, creations from other breeders and you get to pheno hunt those things for things that you think are important. We also get to see us develop things that we've created. I think that, again, it's rewarding relatively quickly as opposed to a lot of other things, so. Do you think you ever get to a point with it where you're like, this is it, like I wouldn't change a thing? Yeah. This is, this is the one, <laughs> I'm just I think curious. It, I think that sometimes like, you know, it's definitely like, this is our best run we've had by far with that. But you're always looking at like the plant that's like two or four weeks behind it, going like, oh, that plant looks great. Maybe or, that one's yeah, little, so well, that's not, always not, the constant. Not even just a pheno, like a, a totally or, different pheno, yeah. or a totally different variety. You right. know, it's like, you're always on to the next one. That's really where Brandon and his team come into this thing. It's like that they're hyper-focused on everything about the plants all day, every day, and, yeah. and trying to like tweak the system to see if we can like, have a better outcome mm -hmm. and, and you don't always get it yeah but he's really good at his job and, and it, he's got a really good team under him that he manages you know and a lot of that the fundamentals of that are the lab so the work that that laura is doing inside the lab is, is is the foundation of what we do as a company so she's putting out a plant that's been kind of reinvigorated with youth mm -hmm. you know and i think that that's Kind of a good way to look at it, making sure that Brandon and his team has the healthiest mother stock, but also making sure that our nursery has elites that they can build their mother stock from. 
Yeah, let's talk about that. What's next for you guys? Oceanside's a, a big part of what we're doing. Oceanside is an area that has been historically really good for agriculture. You're just far enough in from the ocean to, to avoid the marine layer. You're just you know far enough towards the ocean to avoid the heat. We've got plans for three more greenhouses that are for light depth cultivation on that specific parcel. Mm -hmm. um, we did just get our permits approved finally by the city for engineering so that we could develop the site. Great. Um, but you know, as, as you know, it takes a really long time it does. <laughs> to kind of get there. They just looked at us like ag, they'd be up tomorrow. But you guys are getting it done and I'm excited to go see it. Excited yeah. to see the rest of this facility. So we can get Exciting started and, and, and head into the lab and talk to Laura and see a little bit about what she does. Let's do it. Okay. Laura, thank you so much for having us of in your course. tissue culture lab. Tell me a little bit about how you got started in this. So I went to school for biology back in New York and um, I moved out to San Diego to go into the pharmaceutical and biotech industry. I was always in a laboratory setting and I was just looking at new um, job postings and they had a part-time position here at Zenleaf. It was just a lab position. I yeah. probably didn't even read the post. <laughs> and um, when I walked in, I saw a huge picture of a cannabis leaf and I'm like where am I <laughs> and ever since then um, yeah I started part-time went to lab tech and now running the lab that's yeah. amazing yeah yeah so I worked I worked pretty hard to get here so what is it like going from the biotech industry to the cannabis industry well I'm super grateful that I landed this job it was out of nowhere really but you know michael is amazing every single person in this company we have such a good relationship it's nice that we're not so big and it's not really corporate because we all like you know we all know each other that's great yeah so tell me a little bit about what you do in here so yeah, what I do is I just micropropagate. I do genetic banking as well. So we'll keep certain strains in culture and whenever the grow guys are deciding to start flowering the strain that you know we were working on two years ago, lucky for them, I have it in culture. I have an outdoor farm. We buy clones from nurseries and just finding clean clones that are free of hop latent virus yeah. is difficult if not even like impossible so how do you go about cleaning hop latent through the tissue culture process yeah so there's um certain techniques that are known in the tissue culture world um one of them is thermal therapy which is just give you know blasting it with some heat and there's chemotherapy so giving it some antivirals and there's another method called meristem culture which you dissect the meristem of the plant and you make sure you get every single leaf off of it, get all the vascular system away, and then when you put that little ball of cells onto a good growing media, it grows into a clean plant. And what advice would you give to other nurseries that are selling clones to consumers? Uh I would definitely recommend them to test their plants. If they get any new genetics, just test it right away. The smaller the plant is, the more quicker you'll find the viroid, because the problem with the viroid is that it hides throughout the plant. So you might test one side of the plant. It might be active on the other side. Or just get a reputable company that, like, you know, they can provide you testing results that it comes out clean. But for the most part, it's not a difficult plant to work with in culture. Mm -hmm. So I think if, if you just give it love and you give it enough light and good temperature and also like if you're picking the correct plan from the beginning, which is like the most important step, which is always a step that people overlook. Yeah. It's the same thing as picking nice clones in the store, picking nice flour. Definitely start with the best material. Mm -hmm you'll do great. Thank you so much for having us. I guess I'm off to propagation next. So I'm looking forward to seeing your work over there. Appreciate it. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Today my pro tip will be about testing new plants for the hop latent viroid. When it first started coming out to the public, it was shown in the hops and it's because cannabis and hops are in the same family. A couple of signs that your plants have the hop latent viroid might be it's stunted, flower doesn't come out well, um, the plant looks sick, and usually you see it right at the end and that can affect you know, your 
money intake, your whole grow. So it's really good to catch it as soon as possible. The smaller the plant, the easier it is to catch the viroid as well because there's less material. I would recommend to make a 20% bleach fresh, sanitize your scissors. The viroid actually sticks to the scissors and will stick to anything if you use a 70% alcohol. So definitely leave your scissors in 20% bleach for at least a minute. Um, I always use one scissor per plant. And when you go to test the plant, you definitely want to look at the plant. For the most part, you want to test all sides of the plant. Because the viroid is latent, it can be shown on one part of the plant and not show on the other. So I would definitely start with the bottom, just because that's the oldest material in the plant. I would cut one petiole. And the reason we cut the petiole off is because the viroid accumulates in the petiole. I would cut another sample on the other side of the plant and I would just work my way around the plant. I wouldn't test the top necessarily because I have good enough material from all around the bottom of the plant. So that will do just fine to get a positive hit if there is a positive hit. And we just cut the material right into the tube and you wanna cut it as little as possible. And then once you're done, you wanna cap the tube. You shake it for 10 seconds and then we send it off and hopefully it comes out negative. Brandon, thanks for having us today. What got you into this industry? How long have you been doing this? Yeah, I just grew up here in San Diego, kind of on the beach here. I was always into surfing and smoking weed when I was in high school. So I used to sell weed and then I started growing weed. Went from closets to bedrooms to whole houses and garages and then warehouses and then kind of the, the legal market came around and now we're just kind of in full production. Super fortunate to buy the equipment that I want and work with the people that I want, hire the best guys that I can find. And our goal is to you know, just produce the best quality flour that we can make. So you have complete autonomy. This is kind of your your realm in here. Tell me a little bit about the genetics you have going in for your next round. Yeah, some of our genetics, um, we've got white apple tarts. That one's phenomenal, super easy to grow. We've got purple cream, which is amazing. Um, Goofies is one of our new ones. That's from compound genetics. But we do have, you know, 60 different varieties that we tap into and bring back in the rotation. Yeah, Nick's cutting into our mother plants right now. We really only need to have like 10 moms on to fill up one zone in a room. So like each of our rooms are 36 light rooms. Each of our zone is a, a 55 foot long table. And the way we do it is we put one genetic per table. Per table. Um, so so you with, can have the same feeding regimen, your solenoids yeah, are working yes, on the same run. and Totally. Got it. Um, so that gives us the control we need. And then we can also just kind of come to market with more like smaller quantities of variety. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not just like flooding buyers with, you know, an entire room of apples and bananas. Right. And how often do you regenerate your mother stock? Uh, every three, four months. So we don't let our moms get any older than that. With tissue culture. Yeah. So you're yeah. So what we do is, yeah. So we'll run our plants through tissue culture and we'll bring back like an elite mother. And from that mother, we'll take clones off of that to create our new mother stock in here. Um, and so how many clones do you take off a mother in any given? Uh, mom's these size, um, we'll take about 30. Um, we okay. could get more, but just to try and keep the healthiest ones, right. um, we'll, we'll take about 30 clones a month. And then how long before they regenerate? 14 days. 14 so days we cut before you cut weeks. Yeah. from the mom again. Yeah. Environment-wise, what do you keep the temp and humidity in this room? Uh, we try and keep it around 80 degrees, um, sometimes a little warmer, like yeah. 82. Um, and then the humidity is around like 70 to 75%. 
I started using Quest personally pretty much when they first came out and they were like just the best available DUs on the market. We use them everywhere, bedroom, dry room, trim room, everywhere. I kept using Quest through the years just because they were like basically bulletproof. Um, I've had dozens of different Quest units, different models, and I've never had any problems with any of them. And in the rare case of any issue, they've been on it like super quick as far as just any kind of customer support, things like that. Haven't had the need to use anything else. I'm gonna give you a little info on one of our favorite strains, white apple tarts. Um, this strain is from Clearwater. We did a pretty big pheno hunt to find this variety in particular. This plant's super easy to grow. It handles pretty much all the food that we want to do. It's not really picky. Pretty functional. It's not like a super couch lock thing. So if you want to wake up, wake and bake, it's good to go. Do it all day long. So this is day two of flower. Day two flower. This run in particular came from our greenhouse in Oceanside where all of our mother stock is kept. They send us beautiful cuts. We bring them in here at this height. We typically don't top our plants depending on the cultivar. You know, sometimes we will, sometimes we won't. We do three layers of trellis netting. That's pretty much how we ride out an entire run. When will you put on your first layer? How far into flower? Um, I like to do it pretty early. Like I'll do it tomorrow. If I had the time, like I'd do it right now. So once we get out of your yeah, hair, you'll, you be, you'll, here, be we'll be trellising. Okay. <laughs> How long are you going to run these? Uh, we go 63 days. If anything kind of wants to go longer or shorter, we really take it out of our program. With right. the size of the facility and just the rotation that we have, like everything is to the day. 63 you know. flip, yeah. get the next yeah. one in there like clockwork. Yeah. yeah, most of the time we choose to keep a 12 to 14 plant per light canopy. When these get into full flower and you're fully utilizing these lights, what do you prefer at the canopy? Everyone's kind of different. Basically 900 and 1200 are pretty much our sweet spot, but we do have some that'll take more. Everything likes different stuff. Brandon, you have a little bit of variety in this facility of what kind of lights you're running. So tell me a little bit about the lighting in this room. So we've got the new Gavita 1930s. They are dimmed down right now to 400 PPFD. And then uh, every day we start to ramp it up. Once they stop stretching, we're pretty much at our max. And the lights are super powerful. We ran the, the Kavita double-ended for years, loved them. And then we work really closely with Alyssa Russell at Hawthorne. She's been super helpful for us through the years. Um, just kind of getting us on the newer technology. And this was kind of a big game changer for us. They operate just as good, if not better. It's a lot more enjoyable to work under. You know, you're not under that yellow kind of hue that you can't tell what's really going on with the plants. So our HVAC load was cut basically in half and they operate almost flawlessly. You don't have to get up there and change bulbs yeah. every three no. cycles or whatever. No, and I'm whatever. not worried about yeah. anything exploding or anything yeah, like that. That's been a so big I problem. haven't had an issue like that with LEDs. Let's talk about your irrigation setup for a second. Yeah, we designed it in-house, pretty simple. Quick connects and disconnects. Yeah, we've got the Netafin 0.3 GPH drippers. They're all hooked up to a Dosatron, and that's just how we're fertigating the rooms, super simple. Been on Dosatrons for about three years now. I was always kind of intimidated by them and was just always running batch tanks. And then once I hooked one up, I was like, oh, this is so easy. I set up my first Dosatron system probably 15 years ago. And so we set it up, we we plumbed everything, and then I let it sit on the wall for six months because I was too afraid to turn it on. It was like terrifying to me. <laughs> then when I finally did, it was just a game changer. You can really teach anybody how to use them. That's what I love about their system. And I put together a lot of high-tech fertigation systems and it's usually like just one guy in the facility knows how to use it. This right. is like a phone call away and you can easily coach somebody through how to get yeah. your dosing recipe correct. And sometimes those parts aren't really readily available on those like really technical units. Yeah. Um, so we have our spare parts and we're pretty much good to go. The dosatrons are great. You don't need to hook up any power to them. Um, super easy to dial in any kind of amount that we want to run. We have a couple extra dosers in case I want to change nutrients or do something different or, or bring in another additive. 
um, so we're not really married to anything in you particular. Can augment the system. For yeah, what you need. or I can bring in something at a certain point in flower. Yeah. Um, so that's always super awesome. All right. Well, we can get out of your way now. I know you got a lot of work to do, but before I take off, where are we going next? Uh, you're gonna go see Mike in flower room number two. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Deep Roots at Zenleaf. We had a whole lot of fun filming it. And hey, if you have a facility that you want us to film for Canna Cribs or Deep Roots, hit that link in the description and let us know. So we're here in your flower room. Everything looks really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, we're in room C. We've got A, B, C, D, and E here at the building. So five flower rooms. A lot of things are similar. Three of the rooms are running the Gavita 1930s. And then we've got these Gavitas in this room. These are the Gavita 1700s. And what have you noticed switching over from dual-ended HPS to the Gavita LEDs? Well, aesthetically, you know, you can take better prettier. pictures. Yeah, They're prettier for sure. Take for sure, uh, it's easier on the eyes. It's it's a different type of heat. Um, you know, we definitely we can run the rooms a little bit warmer. It, we've got a better spread of light. You know, better light distribution. Uh, LEDs are great because you turn them on, they turn on. You turn them off, they turn off. More importantly, I think the longevity of the lights. You know, no degradation of the bulbs, uh, which is great. It's less draw on the power. Less heat is being created, which helps on our um, electric bill as well. We're actually able to cool these rooms more effectively than we were when we were running double ended thousand watts. You know, you can actually effectively dim these lights. And then when we first bring the plants in straight from veg, we're not running these lights at 100%. So it's nice to be able to set them at like 75% and then start to scale them up. Kind of the funny part about this is the only reason we actually switch because the engineer that had designed the, the mechanical system for this building just got his math wrong. Oh. Um, and so he looked at what lights we were using in veg, which were 630 watts, and assumed we were using those lights facility wide. We didn't figure out his mistake until it was kind of too late. We ran one of these rooms and I was only able to run it at like 60% and still be able to control the environment. My easiest fix as opposed to having to redo the entire mechanical system was to find a light that was gonna, gonna work in this room. And, and LED was really our only option. Uh, once we put in the LEDs, we were able to actually run the room at 100%. It was kind of a good misfortune. Well, I'm glad that option was available yeah. for you. And so what, what varieties are you running in here right now currently? Uh, this room, we're running High Society, we're running Clio, um, and then on the other side, we're running Los Altos. Clio is actually one that we made in-house. The three plants in this room are pretty tall. Yeah. Uh, they just all are. You've seen the other rooms, they, they stay a little bit uh, shorter, but Triple Burger is a, is a GMO, and it just it gets tall, and then uh, you know we cross it with Julius, which has always been a taller plant as well. And how often do you flip your flower rooms? Uh, every two weeks. Every two weeks. Yeah, it gives us enough time to dry. Fortunately, we got a couple of dry rooms, um, so we're able to wiggle back and forth in there. But um, we usually spend about two weeks inside the dry. All right, so where are we off to next? Well, next you're going to go to the dry room. You're going to head up there and see Brandon, and he's going to talk to you about what we do. We are in your dry cure room. Mm -hmm. So you guys whole plant hang here. What do you think is the benefit to whole plant hanging? Typically, it just keeps the moisture in the plant longer. If I were to take it down and not have so much original plant matter on it, it would just dry a lot quicker. Yeah. That can mitigate the, the nose that you're trying to bring out. 12 to 14 days is what we're shooting for. We kind of aim for like a, a 60 degrees and 55 to 60 humidity. Mm -hmm. um, so generally we're done and ready to buck these plants um, into bins at around 12 to 14 days. So is there a timing thing that you follow that's routine or is it touch and feel? Uh, we can't really do it by time because we operate with so many different cultivars in this facility. Things want to dry quicker than others and they just have different feels to them. The moisture in these plants is almost all out. I'm coming in and seeing if they're snapping they're a little soft right now, so they're not quite ready. Mm -hmm. um, another couple days for sure. And once you, you hand trim everything, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah, we don't use a machine for anything. So hand trim everything, then you get it into bags, and mm -hmm. do you have any kind of cure process when you go through that? Yeah, typically it'll go into turkey bags and um, wait you know, about a week, and then we'll kind of start opening them up every day mm -hmm. and go from there. 
we're, we're a wholesale company, so other brands buy our flour mm -hmm. and put them into their jars. And how many brands do you typically deal with in a facility like this? It varies with the way the market is. Right now, we're kind of working with a good 12 different brands. Working with uh, more people allows them to not get burnt out on our varieties. Well, thank you so much for having us in your facility. You've done an amazing job with this place, and I'm looking forward to seeing the greenhouse and some of the other things you guys got going on. And I look forward to watching your growth in the future. My pleasure. Thank you. Hey Mark, thanks for having us today. Absolutely, really Thank appreciate you very much for it. For coming to see us. We're here in Oceanside, California, at your nursery propagation, where you are the general manager of this That's facility. Right. So you have a pretty long history in the cannabis industry. Tell us about how you got started and how you came to be here at Zen. Most certainly, moved down from Humboldt County after going to Humboldt State University and discovered San Diego Hydroponics. Started as one of their only employees, basically sweeping floors, scrubbing toilets, and learning everything about the industry. And that was 17, 18 years ago, and eventually became an owner of the stores, and basically was able to grow the stores into the only real big chain of stores in San Diego County. So you started sweeping the floors, and then you became an owner. Absolutely. That's amazing. It's the American dream right there, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely, <laughs> in action. And that's one thing I really Really love about the cannabis industry. I say that it doesn't have a ceiling. People are given the ability to evolve in this industry. How did you come to be here at Zenleaf? We sold our stores to Grow Generation and I contacted Brandon, the head grower of our Miramar location, and asked him if there was any way that I could get my foot in the door or doing anything, sweeping floors, scrubbing toilets. I'm used to it all, <laughs> so really they decided that they should put me in a general manager role here. Tell me a little bit about what you have going on back here. Certainly, here. so we have different production benches. Each one of the benches will have 200 to 250 you know, mother plants that are all the same genetic. That way we're able to keep up with a customer that needs a 1,200 piece order, a 2,000 piece order. We're able to forecast and able to have enough mother plants to be able to get those cuttings from them. Great, and how big is this nursery? Our mother side is 10,000 square feet and another 10,000 square feet on the other side. So you guys start in tissue culture, you mom out your plants here, then you take your cuttings and throw them into rotation. Yeah, absolutely, and we only keep the mother plants alive for 13 weeks. We don't want any kind of big tall mothers that are really hard and woody. We want everything to be nice and soft and pliable. The longer you keep a plant around, the more potential pathogens could come into it. We do a hop latent testing every two weeks on them just to make sure that there's nothing popping out. We're basically giving the people their start. You know, here's your good start in life, good luck, and we yeah. really can't mess around with the hop latent, powdery mildew. You know, any kind of bug infestation, we just know that, the, I mean, it takes a lifetime to build a reputation, it takes a day to ruin it. Yeah. And we're really, uh, we're, we're all about keeping everything happy. Because so. in the nursery world, your customers' testimonies are your success, right? Absolutely. And it's very easy to get, you know, a negative connotation and it just takes that one person. Let's go check out the propagation side of the greenhouse. I'd perfect. love to see that. Let's do it. Okay, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Hey Sunny, how's it going? Great, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks for having us. What do you do here at Zen Leaf? I manage the operations here at the nursery and the greenhouse. Hey, it's too serious, huh? Now I'm looking at like dead at this thing, like, you're good? When and, and how did you get involved with this team? I've been with the company for a little over a year now. I originally was working at a different nursery in the Bay Area. Before working in cannabis, I worked at a large um, ornamental and uh, edible nursery. So you helped develop the team here. Um, yes. Tell me a little bit about building that team. I, I built a team while relocating down here to San Diego, which had its challenges. You know, I, I would come down for weeks at a time to kind of get things straightened out. How big is your team now currently? Um, at the nursery, we have eight people, including myself and Mark. I like a small team who has a lot of influence over things. That is one of the big things I enjoy working at Zen Leaf. Having designated people in certain, you know, that specialize in certain areas is, is what I prefer in a team. We have three pruners, a driver, a, a sprayer slash maintenance, like sanitation person, and, you know, and then more management that flexes into whatever production needs that, you know, that are needed. Uh, we all rely on each other. 
we all do this together. Do you have a dedicated IPM person? I would say that's myself. My main focus is IPM, and that was really one of my strong suits and why I was brought on to the team. Okay. Um, there are a lot of preventative practices that we do, everywhere from the mom side to the clone side. And so we practice single plant pruning on our moms, which is um, a single pair of pruners, only belongs to a single mom. It's really to prevent the spread of any possibility of hop latent viroid. Um, we spray our moms twice a week, our clone side three times a week, um, also releasing beneficial insects to our mom garden. Just really being on top of the IPM practices, sanitation practices, general basic protocols that I think a lot of grows kind of miss mm -hmm. and that are vital to you know the effectiveness and the healthiness of the plant. So working in horticulture, I got to learn a lot um, and implement a lot of those traditional techniques into a new industry such as cannabis. As a nursery, you need to um, hold yourself to a higher standard of sure. cleanliness of everything because you're responsible for the distribution of thousands and thousands of plants. And other people's success, yes, right? Yes, and other people's success is our success. Right. And it's vital. So IPM sanitation is so important. Yeah. Is there anything about this climate that you like specifically um, for the greenhouse? I think that San Diego is a great growing environment. The light down here is incredible. So the environment really does cater to the style that we're doing. It's kind of a hybrid between the outdoor model and the indoor model it is. meshed together, right? Yes, so the climate controls are probably what set um, the space apart from an indoor, um, as well as the growing practices that best fit into those um, climate controls. So mist is uh, something you do see more in like traditional ag and horticulture. It works really great for us. Getting away from domes is awesome because we avoid getting more material, having to sanitize those hoods. So yeah. while you're in a greenhouse, this is the dome. That's a good way to put it. So it's less labor intensive and yes. we're in a giant dome right now. So I noticed you guys have these really cool heated benches here. What does that do to help encourage plant growth? On the propagation side, we have them sitting into the rock wool. Ideal rooting temperature, you know, around 75, 77 degrees, at least at our location. And it's really vital in encouraging the rock wool to have a dry back and to just promote that ideal temperature within the root zone to kind of just further develop roots at a faster rate. So it encourages growth in the root zone area yes. by heating the rock wool, exactly. creating a dry down process, which speeds up the metabolism of the plant. Yes, exactly, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with me and your nursery here. I think you guys are doing an incredible job and I look forward to your continued success. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. So where are we at right now? What is this place to you guys? This place is called The Smoking Gun. Uh, it's here in downtown San Diego. It's owned by a friend of mine that I went to high school with. He's one of the other owners of Zenleaf as well. It's a nice place. They've got a few places around San Diego. How do you guys feel about, I guess, the state of the industry right now and where you guys are headed for your expansion and yeah, operations? I, I feel good about it. I'm happy to be where we are. Now, up in Oceanside, Sonny's kind of built the team around him and they're really close. I mean, those guys up there start their days doing yoga stretches together. You know? So it's, 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 it's good. Sonny's really smart. You know, Brandon's really good at his job. He came along at a time where we really needed somebody in that position. In the cannabis space, it's a lot of trial and error in the beginning. Like, there's no real good way to learn how to grow except for, like, screwing it up for a really long time. Yeah. You know, fortunately, Brandon came to us after he did that. You know? <laughs> and now he's just doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know I lost a lot of money for the first many years that I was growing, yeah. so. You got like a Harvard education <laughs> yeah. in this thing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's just, yeah, you just it's like, hard yeah. terrible crop after terrible crop yeah. after terrible crop. Throwing equipment away, buying it again. Yep. Oh, yeah. Going back to it. You've done that. You've done that. <laughs> Being in the industry as long as I have, like, I've gone through so many periods of time where people are like, it's not worth it anymore, like, get out while you can, oh, all yeah. this kind of thing. And it's like, as long... It's like it, once a week. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you're putting out good product and you're in that, like, yeah. 90th percentile of what's going on out there, like, you're good. The housing crisis of 07, 08, like, everybody started growing because yeah. they were all losing their homes, you know? Yeah. All of a sudden, prices fell from, like, 4 to 32, and I was like, 
I gotta get out of this. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? yeah. <laughs> Still That's here. Like, look how far I fell since yeah. then. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. And if you don't want to be so dark about just like talking about the industry tanking, yeah. something cool that has come out of it is the fact that growers are more open to talk about like their problems and how they fix the things. The sharing of the Yeah, like I've, I've yeah. never had this much dialogue with other cultivators like we've always been like i'm yeah. not telling you shit yeah and yeah. now it's like cool like you know this, this is out. what i'm doing like yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. has been pretty cool it's kind of like i used to take a lot of workshops with artists uh, there was one guy in particular jeremy lip king up in la and he was a figurative painter and he would get a model in there and he would paint from life and it was like you could see the brushes he was using the paint that he was using how he set up his shots everything about what he did but it didn't mean you can replicate it. There was no fear that he had necessarily that you were going to take that information and like use it against him in a sense or compete with him. Right. And, and most of the time you couldn't anyway. It's like just because you have the recipe yeah. doesn't mean you can make whatever it is. So <laughs> no, it's not as easy as like people want to think that it is. So I'm going to set my place up. It's going to look exactly the way Brandon sets it up yeah. and I'm going to have the same outcome. And it's like, yeah. Meh. Me like that, you know? Yeah. So People don't tend to highlight their losses, so it's always perfect. Yeah, yeah. everybody's every pretty on Instagram. Everyone's better than the last one, yeah. and they're not like, wow, I really could have done this better. Next time I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. And But I feel like, you know, we're getting to a more honest and transparent place because everyone's just trying to help each other at this point, or they should be. Yeah, yeah. kind of, like I said, I believe in the plant and what it has to offer to anybody that engages with it, whether you're cultivating it or consuming it. Yeah. You know, it offers cultivators a, a, a livelihood. You know, I think that's great. It offers end users, you know, relaxation or medication. You know, I think that's it's wonderful. But um, put our heads down and keep working, and hopefully the people that are regulating this thing and the rest of the industry is able to kind of sort it out. Cool. Well, Mike, Brandon, cheers. Thanks for having me. And yeah, of course. And welcoming you to San Diego. It's Thanks been for coming great. out. Absolutely.